We're going to be talking about unity this morning. Unity this morning. If you got a, a notepad and a pen, hopefully you do. Anybody got your words this morning? The Word of God, amen. Come on, some of your words are lighting up. They're glowing, but it's all good. You charged them up. You're ready to go this morning, amen. Uh, we're going to be talking about the breeding ground for revival is unity. The breeding ground for revival, how revival grows, how revival remains, how revival is sustainable, it's through unity. Look at your neighbor say unity. A couple weeks ago, we talked about, uh, about three weeks ago, we talked about the sound of revival, hearing God's voice for ourselves. And two weeks ago, we talked about the breath of revival, and that was hearing and being able to pray prayers that God answers, amen, and that's a repentive prayer, and that's a faith-filled prayer. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago, but this morning, we're going to be talking about the breeding ground for revival. And uh, I don't know about you, but... At your home, at my home, we have a lot of smart things. We got smartphones, right? We got, some people have smart cars. <laughs> some people have smart TVs. Like, that, that's just a common thing that we have these days. All these things are smart, right? Or they say they are, at least. Uh, we, we have one of these things called a Roomba. You ever saw one of those? They just go around, and, and they're supposed to learn your house and clean up. And, but they listen, our Roomba still runs into the wall like full speed, and like turns and runs into another wall. And it's been two years. I don't think it's learned our house yet. <laughs> so we have Alexa. We have Google Home. Like all these aggravating technology that's supposed to link together, but it's all separate and, and really confusing, right? If you, if you could just be honest, it's, it's aggravating. And uh, there's... There's one thing that, that was pretty funny that Mindy brought to my attention the other day. I was out working out a couple weeks ago on a Saturday, preparing and just, just getting my mind right and stuff for, for a Sunday morning service. And Mindy said that our little girl, Jaden, she's only three years old, and she's like at the top of her lungs screaming at the Roomba, the vacuum cleaner that's, that's going around. She said, Alexa, Alexa, Alexa. Play princess music, Alexa. It doesn't work that way, Jaden. Even she's confused. Everybody's confused with technology these days. But I begin to think about if I were to ask Alexa, if I were to ask her, how in the world do I get to revival? I think she would say the first thing that I get to revival is through repentance. We've been talking about that a lot over the past few weeks. To have a repentive heart. To bring our soul back into alignment with what God's purpose and plan is for our life. If I were to tell my wife on the wedding day, we mentioned this three weeks ago. If I were to tell her, listen, I'm forgiving you one time and I'm asking for forgiveness one time. But it's it. It's over. That would be ridiculous, right? It's the same thing. It's equally ridiculous to think that we, are, are, we don't have to ever tell our God, thank you, Lord. I, forgive me. I messed up. I blew it. But I believe if we ask Alexa this, how do we remain in revival? How do we stay unified? How do we stay together? How do we, we live and breathe in revival? I believe that Alexa would say the breeding ground for revival is unity. It's togetherness. It's being in one mind in one accord. It's, it's the breeding ground for something is the place that is fostered. L listen to the definition. The breeding ground, the definition of breeding ground is something that fosters the growth and development of something. That's a breeding ground. So in South Louisiana, we have something called mosquitoes, right? I don't know if you know about these things, but we were just at rollover the other day, and we almost got carried away by mosquitoes. They were so big, like mosquitoes on steroids. But, but the swamp, it fosters, the, the swamp fosters the, the, the cultivation of mosquitoes. They say in the south, in South Louisiana, and in, in the entire Gulf of Mexico, it is the breeding ground for hurricanes. We're in hurricane season. It's the breeding ground because of how the weather mixes together. We rebuke that. But also in the Midwest, they said it's the breeding ground for tornadoes, how, the, how things just come together and how they collide. Well, in, in the West Coast, it's the breeding ground for, for uh, I was about to say revival, revival too. But it's also the breeding ground for wildfires. And fires just, and like we just saw, earthquakes and all these things. I never learned so much about an earthquake in the past two, two days with all the stuff going on. But it's the breeding ground for something. The breeding ground for revival is unity. 
It's togetherness. And if we can rewind to the Acts, uh, the early church in Acts, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, we see that they had something unusual, had something unusually, uh, 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 the same thought process, the same mindset. And this is what it was. It says, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost, this is 50 days uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, on the day of Pentecost, it says, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Say one place. They weren't in two different places. They weren't in three different places. They were together, unified in one place. And something pretty insane happens in Acts chapter 2. I mean, really insane, really crazy. As a matter of fact, Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 says, Wait here and remain until you receive power from on high. We know about that. That's our main scripture in this revival, this summer of revival series. And he says in Acts chapter 2, something great happens. Where they're all in a room together in one mind and in one accord. And not a Honda Accord. <laughs> That's a preacher joke. But they were in one accord, in one mindset. It's not really a funny one either. But they were in one mindset, in one accord, in one vision, in one focus. And something amazing happened. Over 13 different nations were represented at the time. 13 different speaking people group. And now these guys were in the upper room, 120 of them. And a wind begins to blow through the room. Tongues of fire begin to appear on them. They all begin to speak in another language. They all begin, the power of the Holy Ghost just wrecks their life from the inside out. And everybody is like, wow, amazed, the Bible said, and perplexed. Amazed and perplexed. Amazed that, wow, they are speaking my language, but perplexed that I think they might be drunk. Right? That's what they begin to say. I think those guys are drunk. They were drunk, all right. They were drunk on the Holy Ghost, right? They were absolutely intoxicated with God's amazing ability to wreck their hearts. And so Peter stands up like Peter would. Peter stands up and says, hold up, everybody. All eyes on me for a moment. And, and Peter, Peter would talk a lot, but some moments it was ready. For, Peter had his moment on the stage where he was ready to deliver for God because he was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And here Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and it says, Those who believed what Peter said that day were baptized, baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 people in all. 3,000 people. Do you remember back to Mount Sinai back in the day in the Old Testament that 3,000 people died? Jesus came, he was raised, and now 3,000 people are living. That's, that's what Jesus does. He reverses the curse. He reverses everything. Jesus is the ultimate reverser. He can reverse your situation, amen? He can reverse your difficult thing that you're going through as well. But in Acts chapter 2, miracles, signs, and wonders begin to give birth. Unity begins to happen in a, in a powerful way, in an impactful way. And in Acts chapter, chapter 2, it's, it's not just at the beginning that, that unity is alive, but at the end of the chapter, there's even greater unity than at the beginning. As we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, All the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they, they didn't just listen to what was said and go home and just chill. They listened to what was said, they went home, and they lived it out. There was a big difference. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and they devoted themselves to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. You know what he's saying? They begin to hang out. They begin to enjoy each other's company. They begin to live for one another. They begin to go to restaurants together. They begin to be intentionally intentional about relationships, and, and they begin to live their life out as a relational in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says that they worshiped together at the temple each day. Every day they came to the temple. Imagine that. Some, for some of us, it's hard to get people here just one time a week. But they begin to every single day meet in the temple. Why? Because they were unified. Why? Because the Spirit of God was wrecking their heart, wrecking their life. And because he was pulling the greatness out of them, they wanted to be so together. They wanted to be unified. They wanted to lock in, lock in with everything that they had. And I had this question, what does this have to do with revival? What's it have to do with Harvest Time Church, Acts chapter 2? What's it have to do with us? Revival thrives on relationships. Write that down. Revival thrives. It's the breeding ground for revival is relationships. It's unity. 
Amen? It's, it's absolute unity. And if a revival were to spread from you to somebody else, it has to spread, should I say it this way? Revival can't spread out, outside of these four walls if it doesn't take you spreading it. You are the very vehicle that God uses to spread revival. Amen? And that happens by being a good neighbor. That happens by being a good co-worker. That happens by spreading the gospel. How? Through Facebook, right? Through inviting somebody that you go to eat and, and you begin to talk to them about Jesus. And, hey, look what Jesus did to me at the, the altar of Harvest Time Church. He healed my sick body. He changed my life. He could change yours as well. Why don't you come to church with me? Why don't you come and see experience life change forever? This is what we're talking about, being unified together. And we can't have unity without community. We cannot have unity without a community of believers that are thinking the same thoughts like they did in Acts chapter 2, speaking the same thing like they did in Acts chapter 2, confessing the same truths. I believe that one of the biggest sins that we don't even recognize as a sin is division in the body of Christ. I think it's one of the biggest sins, in, and we don't even recognize it as a sin because we see it so much. In 19, I believe it was 1906, there was a man by the name of William Seymour. William Seymour was a pastor. He was also an evangelist. He was so many things all in one, really the fivefold ministry. And God used William Seymour to launch Azusa Street Revival in California. This was an African-American man with one eye in 1906 that had a multicultural uh, uh, congregation that had many different people that didn't look like him, had white people come to his congregation, had black people come to his congregation, had every race, every color, every denomination. And they were about to spread even more. And he said, I'm going to another city. But there were two men who were ministers themselves who said, I, I don't want to see this any longer. I don't want to see this integration any longer. I don't want to see this multicultural generational stuff any longer. And they stopped what God was wanting to spread. In 1906, this was, this was before people were, 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 were Martin Luther King. You understand this, right? This was way back before. And now they split up. So what I'm trying to say, the church divided the church. The church split the church. There was so much power going, and then all of a sudden, boom, the church split the church. We don't even recognize it, but Jesus prayed in his prayer, his last prayer before he went to heaven in John chapter 17. He prayed this prayer, and he talked about us. He said, I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world would know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. He said, I want, this is the one thing that I want them to know, that they be in perfect unity, that they be so unified, that their churches have not only white people, but their churches have African Americans, that their churches have Hispanics, that their churches have Asians, right, that their churches have Indians, that they look like heaven on earth, that they begin to look like something amazing, something powerful. This is what we strive for, and it only happens through unity. We can't have commu unity without community. So if I were to ask you this question, if there's a move of God, which I believe that there is, in this church, what would your personal responsibility be? If there's a move of God, which there is right now, in this church, what is your personal responsibility? I'll answer the question for you. Your personal responsibility is unity. It's being together in one mind and in one accord. It's not the pastor. It's not the campus pastor. It's not the youth pastor. It's all of us unifying together. We all have a part to play. Everybody has a part to play. And I was thinking a couple years ago as I was sitting in the stands at LSU watching the game and the quarterback made a horrible throw. I thought to myself, hey, sitting from the stands, I could make that throw. I literally can make that throw. What I didn't know is that they had six foot five dudes breathing down his neck, right? Big old muscle dudes about to lay on him and lay him out, right? And here I was on the sideline saying, I can make that throw. My time was passed. Everything was passed. But it, then I begin to think about this. There are people that come in this room that say, hey, my time is passed. My time is over. 
But God's saying, no, 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 no. I want you to make the throw in the church. I, I need you to be a part of the team in the church. You are still a part of the team. You are still a part of this congregation. God still wants to use you. If you be unified, if you be together, if you be hungry for a move of God in the same mindset, in the same, come on, somebody. We can do amazing things. In Acts, we talk about it chapter after chapter it says that they were in one accord, they were united, they were breaking bread together in homes. And it just is so, it's so, it's such a burden on my heart because as a campus pastor, as just a person, I live for unity. I live and I strive for unity. I don't want to put my name on something that isn't unified. I don't want to put my, my whatever on anything that's not unified. And that's what we're talking about this morning. And it begins by building a community. Amen? That's what it begins with. A group of people who love each other so much, and it's obvious that they, they love each other so much that they love their father. Amen? That they love their God. I want to talk to you this morning about three commitments, real quick. Three commitments that produce unity. Only three commitments that will produce unity, application, unity in your life. Number one, the first commitment is this. Be committed to the cause of Christ. There is one cause that we are committed to. There are many people that are committed to a lot of different causes. There are people that say, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm an Independent, right? I, I'm a part of Me Too, I, I, I'm a part of abortions, I'm a part of this, I'm a part of this social activist group. I'm, I'm a part of Jesus. I'm a part of His vision. I'm a part of His cause. And that is what unifies us together, being a part of His cause. Jesus' cause, amen? And, and this is what, this is, explains it perfect in Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And it says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. By the way, who has done that perfect so far? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. We've all fallen short, right? Every single one of us have fallen short. I just want to make that perfectly clear. That no one has reached that except Jesus Christ. Right? So he says, do all these things, and then he said the second thing. This is the one that people don't want to hear. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor, unity, as you love yourself. So, so I begin to dissect this just a little bit. I can't love my neighbor until I love myself. I, I got to find a, 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 an identity in me and who God has created me. I got to have a healthy love for myself in order to love my neighbor. The same neighbor who lets his dog come take a dump on my yard. The same neighbor who, who literally keeps my golf balls when I hit him over his fence. The same neighbor. I got to love him. I got to love the guy, right? He came knocking on my door one day, and he's an Asian guy. He said, hey, 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 I, I, water come in my house, water house, water in house. And I, I understood he was soaking wet, so I knew water was in his house. So I ran outside, not knowing what to do, and he's looking outside. I'm looking outside, and I remembered, oh, I remember where the water line is. So I'm digging, digging water up for him. I, I start cranking on it. I said, wrench, wrench, no wrench. Okay, water, water, turn, turn, turn. I couldn't get it off, and then eventually... I got it off. Why did I all say that? Just to be a good neighbor. Love your neighbor, man. Love your neighbor. We're in the community of believers. We are a, a community of believers. We're going to love, man. We're going to passionately pursue God, and we're going to pursue him together in love. I don't care who it pulls me from or who it puts me with. If I'm on this stage or if I'm in New York City preaching to millions, I don't care. I'm going to love somebody like I've never loved them before. We got to love, man. That's what we got to do. We have to have a love for each other. And 92% of Americans uh, consider themselves to be independent, not a party, but financially independent, uh, uh, physically independent, all these different independents. And it's not bad financially to be independent in the world. I understand that. But it, the problem becomes when we take the independent mindset and we move it into the church. We are called to be codependent on each other. We are supposed to lean on one another and share gifts, share abilities. We are the body of Christ Jesus. Amen? And spiritually, God wants us to depend on one another. That's what he wants to do. Number two is this. Be committed to a community of believers. Be committed to a community of believers. And you're in this community, so why not here? 
Why not now? I'm committed to this community of believers. I'm going to keep the unity in this community. Amen? I'm going to be committed to, to unifying and to lifting up other people. I'm going to share meals together. I'm going to go out and hang out together, right? I hope right now I'm sparking something in you where someone in this section begins to text someone in this section right now and someone in this section texting someone in that section saying, where are we going to eat after this? Where are we going to hang out after this? Why? Because intentional unity happens intentionally intentionality it's got to be intentional amen we got to move from spectating to communicating together yeah. the breeding ground for revival is unity say unity. unity Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 Paul says it this way so now you Gentiles you're no longer strangers or foreigners you are citizens along with all of God's holy people you are members of God's family we're members of a family that's higher than harvest time. We are members of God's family. Amen? And the only family that doesn't member together is a family that is dysfunctional. The only family that doesn't meet or hang out with family, you can, you, some of you might come from a dysfunctional family. If you think about it, you don't hang out with the family. Why? Because they're dysfunctional. They'll start trying to get money from you. They'll start trying to do things from you. They'll start trying to, trying to, trying to jive, trying to move, trying to hear, do the, these things. The moment that a dysfunction comes into a family, now all of a sudden the perspective of, of God's family has changed. Now you start to think, oh, because my family's messed up, oh, God's family must be messed up. No, 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 no. God's family has a bunch of broken people in it, but we serve an absolute perfect God. Absolute 100% perfect unifying God. Remember his prayer in John 17, 23, that we be perfectly unified together amen in one body first corinthians 12 14 says for the body does not consist of one member but of many members many members and each and every one of us have a specific gift that is absolutely important for the body of christ you know what i think that we need to begin to do be intentionally relational intentionally going out of our way and having an invite culture and, and not just inviting people to church, but I'm talking about inviting people. Listen, this is what God began to minister with me. When I'm at High Nam after service and I'm sitting by myself with my family and I see some couple walk in, instead of just saying, hey, I, I, service was great, right? It was amazing, man, love you guys. And they go sit by themselves. It's like, pull up a table. Let's minister together. Let's hang out together. Your family with my family. We're about to member back together. We're about to be unified in this next season of life, amen? We are going to do this together. That's what it looks like. It's, it's saying pull up a chair. It's creating opportunity that goes out of our way, even as an introvert, because by nature, I am an introvert, man. I could be back there doing just the camera work and all that stuff and be absolutely satisfied, but God has called me to do something else, and I, I got to be okay with it, so welcome to the, the Campus Pastor Introvert Club, <laughs> right? I'm an introvert, and by nature, I just want to go chill. Hey, but God hasn't called. What am I going to do? How am I going to win people by going and chilling? It's not going to happen. But God has pushed me and risked me, and I'm getting ahead of myself. But God has pushed us, and he will push us to be unified, intentionally unified. And listen, Mindy and I make it a point to have people over to our house because it's important that we are unified. It's important that we have people to our house, and, and we make it a point of ours to, to get people over and to be able to speak into their lives and let them speak into our lives as well. As a matter of fact, just a couple days ago, we had some of our very good friends, Stephen and Janae, over. And we just let them speak into our life. And, and Stephen, man, if you know him, he is a man of faith and fire. And he just spoke into my life. I didn't get one word out, but it was all good. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> he, he spoke into my life. And I love that about you, though. I love that about you because you just, you got to find somebody like a Stephen. You got to find somebody in your, in, in, sitting next to you that will speak into your life. When you're down and out, you know what? He's spoken to my life. When, I, when I'm making a mistake, you know what? He speaks into my life. When he says, hey, Stephen, what, you ever thought about this? He's speaking into my life. That is important to me. It's important to you as well. And this is what I wrote this down. Many and I might not be able to do it for everyone, but everyone could do it for someone. Everybody can do it for somebody. Right? You could have somebody in this church and you could do it for someone. There's a someone out there that needs you to be intentional. And number three, we're talking about three commitments that produce unity. Number three is this, be committed to keeping the unity in this community. 
be committed to saying, I stop gossip. I stop slander. I stop people talking about my pastor. I stop things that are, that are going to divide and break up. I stop it in its track because I'm a unifier. I'm a bridge builder, amen? I'm a person that's going to bring one person to one side to the other side. And I can't be a bridge builder if I'm a broken bridge. Bridle our tongues, amen? And stop gossip in its, in its place. I'm going to contend for unity. I'm going to stop stupid gossip and stupid rumors. Why? Because we are children of God. And if we are children of God, Psalms chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, it's true about me and it's true about you. It says, they refuse to slander or insult others. They'll never listen to gossip or rumors. Come on, can I get an amen? They will never even harm one another with their words. Amen. They will speak out passionately against evil and evil workers while commending the faithful ones who follow after truth. They will make firm commitments and follow through even at great cost. That's true about me if I'm a believer of Christ. Come on, it's true about me if I'm a believer of Christ. It says they refuse to slander. I'm going to stir up the unity in this community. This house, God, God is breathing on this house. Amen. God is doing a miraculous work in this house, and it's going to happen. It's going to remain the breeding ground for it is unity. That's what it is. It's unity, being unified. So four quick things, quick things. You got, you got about five minutes? Amen. All right, good. Unity, number one, is selfless. Unity is selfless. What does unity look like? Number one, it's selfless. It's thinking of others as better than myself. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 says it this way. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourself. When is the last time that we've done that? When we thought the person next to us is better than myself. Mindy is far better at so many things than me. She is better. And only reason that, that, that I am up here is because of her. I mean that with all my heart. Scotty is absolutely better at so many things than me. I mean, he could work a spreadsheet. He could, he could lift way more weight than me. He's so much better at things than me. But seriously, I got to begin to think Dustin is far more articulate than me. Absolutely amazing. He could put words together and make you go to sleep and just pray hallelujah at the same time. Absolutely amazing. He's amazing. And you got to begin to see people as far more better than yourself. And not in this way of, oh, poor me, I'm weak. And No, 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 no. Unity is selfless. It's more about lifting someone else than it's about tearing someone down. Unity is, is not about me. It's about someone else being lifted up. It's about someone else standing on my shoulders and going further than I've ever been. That's what unity is about. Number two is unity is having fun together. Come on, you know the world don't want to come to a bunch of people that look like they drink uh, sour pickle juice, right, just in the morning. Like, I, we're in revival, bro. We're in revival. Like, we're in revival. It's powerful. It's anoint. We're in revival. It's, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. Like, man, like, take it or leave it, but it'll change. It changed my life. No, no, no. People, people want to have fun. People want to be a part of a group of people that are having fun. Amen? People want to be a part of a group of people like Stephen. We go watch fights. We went bowling last night, right? We went hang out last night. And I'm using Stephen because we literally did everything like the past two days together. And, and later on, I'm bringing Carrie and Jay, and we're going to eat out together later on. Come on, unify. It's what it is. It's having fun together. It's living life together. It's stirring. It's, it's the breeding ground for revival. Having fun and, and, and just being able to hang out together. They ought to look at us and say, hey, they are having so much fun. I need to be a part of what they're a part of. I got to be a part of what they're a part of. Amen. Go on vacations together. Sunday morning should be the happiest place in the world. Not Disney World, right? Not, not anywhere else. Sunday morning should be the happiest places on the world. Not the barbecue that we, we, we burned, our, singed our hairs off, right? Because the fruit of the Spirit... The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. If you're happy and you know it, I heard a pastor say this one time, tell your face. Come on, if you're happy and you know it, let your face know it as well. Like, hey, it smiles good sometimes, right? It'll do wonders for people. But sometimes I catch myself, man, walking into Walmart, like mugging people. What's up? And I remember like, gosh, I'm, I remember who I am, but also I carry 
a little bit of, of God, come on, Stephen, just smile a little bit. And I got to talk to myself. And, like, I'm working out in the gym, like, boom, headbanging. But I'm headbanging. They don't know I'm headbanging to Hill songs. They think I'm headbanging to, to Drake or something. And I'm, yeah, working out. And, and what am I trying to say? Put a smile on your face. Come on, have the joy of the Lord as your strength. Amen? And number three is this. Unity is trusting one another. It's beginning to trust one another. I need some volunteers. Stephen Dustin. I need, I need some strong men, uh, Scotty, I need Colin, I need some guys over here, <laughs> if y'all can, if, if y'all don't mind real quick. I, I want to show you, Unity's trusting one another. Jay, come on up here real quick. If you, y'all could come right here. Unity's trusting one Y'all ever heard of the trust fall? What about the running trust fall? Y'all just turn and, y'all don't drop me now. Y'all turn, look, make, like, face each other like this. Face each other. Look, Scott. <laughs> All right, we're going to see if it works. I'm not sure if it works, but we never practiced this, by the way. This is what unity is. It's trusting. It takes a risk. I'm not sure if these guys are going to catch me, but if they don't catch me, y'all sue them, right? It's not about me. So this is what unity is. This is, hey, y'all ready? Y'all ready? Yeah! Come on, it's trusting one another. Thank y'all so much. Unity is trusting, man. I, I got to lay out. This is what unity, this is, this <laughs> Man, I was nervous for a second. <laughs> Love y'all, man. That's my brothers. <laughs> oh, man. But if we're honest, that's what it takes. I know some of you have walked through difficult situations, and you've, le- you've, you've forgotten how to trust because you trust that father that did something wrong to you. And now all of a sudden, you don't want to trust anybody else, and there's, there's, a, there's, there's, this, there's this block that's in you. There's the block. There's this risk that is taken with trust. Trust is a risk, right? But it's worth an amazing reward. When I laid off my feet, man, it felt good to lay into those guys' arms. I'm just being real. It felt good to fly for a second. Listen, it's going to feel good when you begin to trust one another. When you begin to lay your hand out and say, hey, look, man, you can tell me your problems, and I'm not going to gossip them on Facebook. I'm not going to tell them to other people, but I'm going to keep them at heart. I'm going to pray for you, brother, and we're going to see that this life is, is better on the back end. That's what trust is. Number four is this. Trust and real, uh, unity is being real with one another. Unity is being real with one another. No matter what it is, through thick and thin, unity is being real with one another. I went through a season about probably about two months ago, maybe three months ago. And when I went through this season, it was probably one of the darker seasons for me. One of the things, it wasn't long ago at all. In the middle of preaching, in the middle of all this, I'm just being real with you. Pastor Steve was hurting bad. Woo, DJ. <laughs> that was a mixtape right there, <laughs> scratch. But Pastor Steve was, it was my father, man. So I'm just being real with you. And, and what I saw dad go through, it just broke my heart. And what I was seeing him going through it had broken my heart. And at the same time of all this, he says, hey, son, I need you to carry the load and, and, choose how you want to say it or not I need you to carry the load of this church and I took the cares of the church on my shoulders and I was not ready for the care the weight of the church on my shoulders and I had to reach out to Dustin and I said Dustin I know you remember this I said hey I need help right now because I don't feel called I don't feel like I'm a good husband. I don't feel like I'm a good leader. I don't feel, as a matter of fact, I feel like God is calling me into something else. I feel like I need to leave this place. I could do better in the oil field. I could do better. And I just begin to beat myself up. That's what the enemy will do. Just begin to beat yourself up. All day long, I begin to beat myself up. And Dustin spoke life into me. And whenever he began to speak life into me, I opened up to him and he was able to pour into me. And when he began to pour into me, you know what I began to think of? You know what? I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. You know what? I I do have God on my side. He has created me as his masterpiece. You know what? He brought me back to when I was 13 years old, when I was at the altar of Tommy Birchfield's, and and, and Tommy Birchfield laid his hands on my, my head, and he said, son, you'll speak to millions. He brought me back to that moment when I was beating myself up. Whenever Joel Stockstill told me there's something special about you, he brought me back to these places where God would just begin to speak life into me. And he will do the same for you if you begin to trust one another, begin to get real with one another. That's what unity is. It's being real with one another. 
It's trusting. It's opening up yourself. And the moment that you open yourself up, you know what happens? Someone else is going to open up to you. That's what's going to happen. It's the important part. And you know what's even more important? Being real with God. (laughs) Being real. God, I messed up. He knows it all. But it's just letting him know, God, I, I know you know that I messed up, but I know there needs to be real trust between me and you. Let's link up together, guys, and fight this stupid devil of division. Fight this de- devil of dysfunction. Amen? Because truth be told, I believe that this church can start revival and sustain revival in Abbeville. Amen? It could end fatherless homes. It can end that. It can end opioid use in Abbeville. It can end undereducation in Abbeville. I believe that this church is a church, a city on a hill. I know they have other great churches in this community, but we say yes, amen? We say, why not us, God? We're unified. We're together. We're in this, in this fight together, amen? And that's what Jesus is doing. Whenever he died on the cross, you know what he did? He died on the cross to gather us together, to gather all of us together. In communion, in unity. You could come on up, Chase, as we're preparing for our communion this morning. I want to read a scripture to you. I'm praying for unity like never before in the church. Amen? I'm praying for unity, and I'm going to contend. Will you contend for unity in the church like never before from this day forward? I'm going to contend for unity. Worship team, you could come on up. I want to end with this scripture, and you could all stand on your feet as we're preparing for our communion this morning and we're out after communion in Psalm chapter 133 verses 1 it says this way it says how truly wonderful and delightful to see brothers and sisters living together in sweet unity how truly wonderful it is to see people that don't look the same living in sweet unity Let's see people that maybe don't talk the same, living in sweet unity. That's what it's all about, amen? And we're going to partake communion in the next few moments. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the heart of unity, amen? The heart of togetherness. And our worship team is going to play and our singers are coming up right now. I want us just to prepare our hearts right now. for God. What communion really is, is remembering what he did for us. And when we remember what he did for us, he will remember us together. He will put the arm back on the body. Amen. He'll put the leg back in its place. He will, any fracture that's there, he will put it back, the bone back into alignment. Can I pray for you real quick first? Father, I declare, Lord Jesus, that this morning there be perfect unity, God. I declare, Lord Jesus, that we contend for unity, Father God. We remember what you've done for us, Lord. We'll never forsake it. We'll never forget it. I want everybody. Now let's just pray. We're going to pray ourselves out right now. Father, we thank you, Lord. We genuinely thank you, Father, for a powerful service, God. Unify us, Lord Jesus. Change us, God. Lord, bring us together, Father God, in such sweet unity, such togetherness, God. Let us share meals at our homes together. Lord, let us be burdened, Father God, to be intentionally relational and have a culture of invite in everything that we do. We love you, God. We thank you for each and every person that came in this room, God. Bless each and every person. God, we call them blessed going in, blessed going out, God. Let this word, Lord Jesus, be relevant in their, when they go to their houses today in their neighborhoods and in the streets, Father God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are a community of believer. We promise, God, to keep the unity in this community. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Let's play that song one last time. You are dismissed. Thank you, guys.